don't worry, I, I'm not Ted Kaczynski. It's just really cold here, below zero. And even though it says it's 67 degrees in this house, I'm, I'm chilly willy. So what warmed me up this morning was Mary Stewart Masterson. Unfortunately, it was only on videotape. She was on later with Bob Costas on this day in 1992. She was promoting the not yet released film, Fried Green P Potatoes, no, Fried Green Tomatoes. And they focused in on two things. Her great role with the, in the James Woods movie, uh, Immediate Family, and her ascent to being a, a movie star. Wait till you see what movie she made her debut in as a little kid. Really cool. Another stellar episode of Later with Bob Costas. More, Bob, more. Finish out your career interviewing people. Come on, do it, do it, do it. Thanks for staying up later. Our guest tonight is the actress Mary Stuart Masterson. You know her work from the John Hughes film, Some Kind of Wonderful, from Immediate Family with Glenn Close and James Woods. Uh, upcoming Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe. Have I got that? You got it. That title right? Mm-hmm. And it's not exactly like uh, <laughs> show business was a big leap for you because you grew up in that environment. I, yeah, I did. My parents are both in the biz, but I, I made the leap to film, I think, while they were more in theater. And so I was thrown to the wolves, as it were. Um, I mean, at least in my pseudo-adult life when I was 17 or whatever. But when I was really little, I did a movie that my dad was in called Stepford Wives. <clears throat> and I was cast, I guess, because I was, the director came to the house and saw me and it wasn't all that big a stretch. I, I was playing my father's daughter, so. Um, but then uh, after that, it really was not something I was positive I was gonna do. It, I didn't want to think it was gonna be that easy, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. And it wasn't easy, it never is, but, um, but I, I thought maybe there were other things I should think about, and so I, I thought about them and then went straight to acting. Your dad is Peter <clears throat> Masterson, who has uh, directed and written and, and acted, and of course, uh, your mom... Producing now and everything. Your mom is Carlin Glenn, who uh, won the Tony Award and best known for her role in Best Little Whorehouse in mm -hmm. Texas on the Broadway stage. Right. Did they discourage you, encourage you, try to take a neutral position? Uh, they were both. Um, really, I think what they discouraged me from was uh, treating, treating acting as a profession instead of an art at a young age. They, they uh, always surrounded us with, um, I don't know, the, the, proper, the proper exposure to really good actors and artists and famous people who are real people and the glamour wasn't a part of it for me uh, and the hard work was a part of it for me the whole uh, issue of artistic integrity was you know paramount to uh, you know exposure or fame or whatever and uh, and the work you know the work and collaboration and all that kind of thing and the art itself of acting or whatever it is was was so much more a part of it than the profession that I didn't get you know sort of polluted with um, being a professional as a child and because that was their most um, I think um, their biggest worry was that I'd be you know a child actress or mm -hmm. you know doing soap commercials or instead of going to school so I really um, they kept me really in school but they didn't discourage me from the idea of it um, and they tried to show me as much as they could so that I could make my own decision ultimately. So those attitudes probably helped you to reach oh, yeah. the kind of decision you reached a bit later where after you'd had some film success, you left Hollywood and, and went to Texas yes. and, and just like stepped aside for two or three years, right? Yeah, I really did. I, I don't know if it was all that conscious. I, I didn't feel happy with um, uh, my, my feelings about my work. It wasn't that I thought the movies were terrible or or whatever, but I, I started, uh, <clears throat> I think, feeling as though uh, I, w I was reacting to what people would say or what the reviews said or things like that, which which always had been something I was trying really hard not to do, you know, become reactive to my own life or think, oh, that doesn't fit into her image, you know, maybe she should do something else. And suddenly I'm talking about myself in the third person and it's time to get out of Hollywood. You yeah. know? I never lived there, but 
but I was I was definitely influenced by it and, and a part of the whole business scene and and definitely wanted a, a little bit of change and confront myself. God, how boring. <laughs> you know, wake up and look in the mirror and wear sweatpants all day and, you know, play with the dog. <laughs> Was, wasn't your husband or future husband involved in something and maybe that made it a little bit easier that oh, you yes. go to his side in Texas or something? Absolutely. Or? Um, he, he was sort of my childhood sweetheart and I went back down to Texas to visit my family and, and uh, saw him and we got back together or whatever. But um, then I, I made the decision to really be there and uh, spent a lot of time there as opposed to, you know, being in the house I'd just bought in Connecticut. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, that, that was r the reason I think I was there, but it, just the being there was a good excuse to drop out a little bit. So I guess being there preceded the decision to pull back, you know, but, but it was convenient and I think good for me. <laughs> I haven't seen everything you've done, but one performance that sticks out for me was in Immediate Family, where you play uh, this... Uh, Blue pregnant. <laughs> well, pregnant, definitely. I was going to say blue collar, but that doesn't sort of really sticks capture out it. In your mind. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Lower economic circumstances mm -hmm. than what blue collar suggests. Woman who finds herself pregnant, and she's decided she's going to give the baby up for adoption. Glenn Close and James Woods uh, have been waiting for a child, and the relationship develops between uh, that couple and and you. Right. That was that was a great experience. I mean, I loved doing that. The <clears throat> Jonathan Kaplan, the director, was just so supportive. Again, it was another situation where um, if I feel like they trust me and I trust them, it's just the less said the better almost. It just works um, in, in a sort of silent way. And, of course, it's not to say that they didn't direct me, but it's just to say that there's really a, a neat, um, silent, partnership going on and I had so much fun, you know, buying the clothes for that and, you know. There's a scene where the child's been born, you're in the hospital, you go to the little viewing area where they keep the newborn <laughs> children and you look through the glass. Yeah. Now your decision's been made and you know that this child's going to be given up to people who at least outwardly appear to be able to give the child a better life and you go through a neat little trick. Uh, where you can see the look on your face and you're being won over by the child and, and the love is there and, you're, and you're, you're vulnerable and touched by the child and then all at once you gather yourself because you know you can't let yourself feel that way. It'll be too painful. And the expression changes. It's really good for me to see um, my work because I, I, it's hard to be objective, of course. And I find that if I see what I'm doing then I can... I mean, I always feel it inside, and I'm never positive whether it's, if it's out there, you know. Yeah. And uh, so it makes me know how much work is actually visible and how much is, you know, eternal. And, and uh, with something like that, it's, it's subtle. I mean, I, I don't know if, I guess you got what I was trying to do, so it worked. But I would never have thought that that was such a big deal, you know. I would have gone, oh, I should have done it better. Or I should have tried something different. Do you think about stardom <clears throat> obviously you're not preoccupied with it but do you ever think about it do you ever think about there'll be some roles and i'll break through not necessarily for the objective of walking down the street and having people recognize you but stardom can lead to the kind of vehicles that you'd be more interested in maybe right may oh sure well in that sense it's always been nice the more attention you get the more scripts you have to choose from which is always nice um uh, and again, I get pigeonholed by some people to be one thing and other people to be another thing. For example, I'll walk down the street and somebody will go, oh my God, da, da, and they'll think of me as that one thing, whatever movie it is that they identify with, and they won't necessarily know that I've done, you know, the flip side of maybe that type of character I also think in a it's possible movie. that they might know your work and not recognize you walking down well, the street true. because you look very different that's in true. a lot of these roles. That's true. That's definitely true. But in terms of stardom, that's a weird question because for a while you can act really deep and, you know, artistic and as if these things don't matter to you. But frankly, it's the kind of business where if you don't reach people, you're not, you know, doing your job. <laughs> you can't act in a closet. And um, so, yeah, I want to be, uh, I guess, First of all, I want to think I'm good. 
And if I think I'm good in something, I want other people to see it and think it's good. Um, beyond that, um, stardom is a whole other ball of wax. You know, that's recognition. I think fame is a really weird animal. And um, some people are really good at it. I mean, some people can do these kinds of things and sit there and say exactly the right thing, and they're totally political, and yet you'll never know it from watching them that they're being political. You know, whether they're setting themselves up, perhaps lying about their entire life, not really trying to answer the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I always try to really answer the question, so I guess I won't be a star. But um, they, they also always look well, or they have a thing, a hook, you know? And like a, 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 a riff that's theirs. And, and I, I don't. I, I want to act. I don't want to be a celebrity for, for my life. You know what I mean? We're back now with the actress Mary Stuart Masterson. You played, uh, again, your father's daughter in <laughs> Gardens of Stone. Mm-hmm. Where, uh... This time I got him the job. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Actually, yes. Um, Francis Coppola wanted, um, my parents, because he adored them, and who wouldn't, but they were such teeny parts, he didn't think I could, he could ask them until, um, until I was cast and everything. Then he said, do you think your parents would be willing to do us the honor of, it's like, well, I'll ask them. So they said, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, and it was very laid back, the casting. A Vietnam film, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, your dad's a Marine officer, and you fall in love with an enlisted man, Right. which doesn't seem like all that much to most of us, but in that setting... It's Capulets that, and Montague time, you Yeah, know? that was a big deal. Yeah, yeah. You're an NCO, you know. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was fun. Um, it, I, there was a scene that was mostly cut that um, was really kind of hard to do where I'm yelling at my father, who I worship, basically, and um, my own father, and uh, so I was, you know, yelling at the character's father, and it was just really hard. And uh, they cut most of it out, but I mean, I just build this huge, awful, <laughs> you know, angry, I nail him, you know? And that, that was really, that was really hard. Um, he was really good. He didn't have a hard time being <laughs> a jerk, <laughs> but... Uh, Anyway, did that you talk about fun. it beforehand? And um, no, not really, not really. We didn't, um, because, you know, I, I don't think it would have helped any. But that, in a situation like that, you have to think, well, what am I going to draw from here? You know, you can't really dig out something that, uh, from your, you know, from your past with your father, because he's sitting there. You know what I mean? You can't use something, literally the same, from the same circumstance. You can't use a substitution or whatever. Um, and you just have to, and, and you can't fight the fact that your father is sitting right there and he, the same man who's your father and um, who you love to death. So I thought, well, I have to work out of love, which is very close to hate. So I th just thought I'd, you know, work from there, but, but it, wa it was hard. It was really hard. It's one of the hardest things I had to do. The uh, next movie for you, Fried Green Tomatoes, what's it about? Two hours. Um, <laughs> I'll be your straight woman, Mary Stewart. Oh, it's really hard. A straight man. Um, and that was an interesting Freudian statement at we, this hour of the night. Do you want to talk? <laughs> Maybe I should sit in that chair. <laughs> but, um, actually, I was trying to think of a way to describe it. I think it's sort of um, an anthem for Southern women, all these uh, Southern women who have to learn to um, be themselves and uh, defy the sort of narrow uh, social prescription of what a woman is and that sounds like a very heavy way of describing it but really it's these women in the present day one is sort of in a rut and meets up with an elderly woman in a nursing home that's Kathy Bates and Jessica Tandy and Jessica Tandy tells a story about people she knew when she was growing up and how they inspired her and and it in turn inspires Kathy Bates to you know just turn her whole life around and get after it and not live a reactive life, mm -hmm. so to so speak. And uh, my character is the sort of, the story in the past. The, they take me from the age of seven to 43. I don't play the seven-year-old. Um, <laughs> but I do play the 43-year-old. You were talking about age. Um, and I go from being a, you know, a person who can't fit in, won't fit in, um, doesn't want to be a part of the feminine thing 
in that period. And I would hate to call her a tomboy because she's not. She just doesn't want to be what men want women to be. <laughs> she doesn't want to be a man. She wants to be her own woman. She uh, starts out as this fishing, hunting, wild, bee charming, uh, wildly independent, untamable person and grows into being a cafe owner and uh, a champion of justice and saves, uh, sort of gets in between the clan and the um, black people who work for her and are kind of like her family and gets involved in a murder case and is accused of murder and her best friend is, uh, lives with her as a woman and she has a baby and there's all this brouhaha about that and so anyway she's a very controversial woman and, uh, and I think sort of uh, a charmer, storyteller, liar. Um, but she's, she's the local entertainment because she's this cafe and she goes around uh -huh. and tells people stories and slings hash and tells the truth and scares people <laughs> by telling the truth. I see your dad, Peter Masterson, a lot at Knicks games. And this passion for sports in general and basketball in particular runs in the family, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, look at me. You say the word and I blush. Um, yes, it does. I love basketball. My dad loves every sport. I mean, he, he'll read the sports page with his friend, you know, the writer, Bill Goldman, and look at lacrosse scores and track team scores and everything. I, I'm more of a basketball fan and, and, um, and a Celtics fan in particular. Now you tried to mumble Celtics fan. Well, you, you people, never lived in people Boston, right? have a hard time with that. You never lived in Boston. No. You grew up in New York. Yes. Spent time in L.A. Dave DeBush is a close personal Texas. friend of the family. It doesn't make any sense. I know. And he got mad the last time I was on television and mentioned that I adored Kevin McHale and Larry Bird. And uh, not mad. He has respect for them, of course. But uh, he said, what about the Knicks? I, don't, I love the Knicks, but, you know, I'm a New Yorker. But I don't know. There's a particular passion I have for the Celtics. And I actually, I don't know what it is. It's the, the team ethic and the hard work ethic and, and, uh, Red Auerbach and his whole philosophy. Parquet floor. Yeah, the whole, the magic, Little leprechauns. Mystique, the tradition, <laughs> all of it. I, I don't know, I'm a sucker. And, um, you know, I, I have to say that I actually met Kevin McHale, and he was very nice to me. And he actually took a picture with me. And, um, and it changed my life. And I was, <laughs> I was writing letters to him for a week from then on and Un ripping them off. Unmailed letters? Unmailed yeah. letters, yeah. <laughs> it was really pathetic. I almost flew, I had to go the next day to LA for a meeting. And I almost flew back to Philadelphia for the, for the next game after the time I met him um, to go to the game. It's really embarrassing to admit this. Is this the first time you said this? Is this the first? You In know, public. I, I, happen, I happen to know, and ah. I wouldn't say this if it weren't true, because mm -hmm. he told me this. I mean, like a lot of athletes, he stays up late. He watches this show a lot. Ah! He could be watching now. Is this the yeah, first he's heard this? He inspires me. The team inspires me. Basketball inspires me. Because, uh, because I think there's something about, uh, and uh, I'll use acting terms because I'm not a basketball expert, but the whole uh, improvisational nature of basketball and the, damn it, the drive and the physical endurance and get up there and do it and show up and all those things that I have to keep telling myself when things get hard and you really could complain and go, I want to go to my trailer. You know, I think, what would Larry do? What do you hits the floor against Indiana and is knocked unconscious and gets back up and plays yeah. the rest of the game. You know, um, and brilliantly, you just have to be inspired by people like that. What, what, else, what else can fill you with awe? Geraldine Page. <clears throat> um, sailing sometimes when you're on a plane and reaching. Is, uh, when I've run a really long way and I go farther than I think I can, or... Um, acting in a scene and it seems to work for that one. There's sometimes where you go into, uh, everything's working and it becomes as unconscious as it is conscious and you go into this kind of high state where all the conscious stuff kind of goes behind your head and you're just in the moment and it feels so good and it's what you work for and that happens for like a minute uh, out of every movie, you know. Here comes... Coming up, Mary Stewart Masterson in fried green tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe. If there's an NBA arena in your town, you might see her there as well. <laughs> and we're out of here. See you later. <laughs>